the street with his brim pulled way down low. There ain't no sound but the sound of his feet. He comes ready to go. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? Are you hanging on the edge of your seat? Out of the darkness, the bullets are ripped to the sound of the feet. Yeah. Another one bites the dust. Another one bites the dust. And another one gone, another one gone, another one bites the dust. Wait, he's gonna get you too. Another one bites the dust. Too. Gonna get along without you when you're gone. You took me for everything I own, and you kicked me out of my home. Well, are you happy? Are you satisfied? How long can you stand the heat? Out of the doorway, the bullets to rip up to the sound of feet. Yeah. Oh, another one bites the dust. Yeah, another one bites the dust, and another one gone, and another one gone, another one bites the dust. He's gonna get you too. Another one bites the dust. 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 And another one gone. And another one gone. Another one bites the dust. Wait, he's gonna get you too. Another one bites the dust. This is our second sermon in this series, Horns and Halos. I mean, we, we went to Facebook and asked you guys, hey, what's your question about this spiritual battle that we're in? And we're going to try to cover some of those questions uh, throughout this series, Horns and Halo. And uh, we started out last week talking about the spiritual battle, that there's this epic battle going on in the spiritual realm between good and evil, and it's a struggle for our soul. Now, we know that we, 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 we said last week God has created us on purpose, with a purpose, and for a purpose. God's got a plan for your life, but the devil has a plan for your life as well. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That is the devil's plan for your life. Now, what, he's got a lot of tools in his arsenal. And one of those tools that he throws at us, one of the weapons, is temptation. And we're going to talk about that today. The, the devil made me do it, right? That influence that he has over us. Um, I want to set it up kind of like this. And, and I want to ask you a question. I don't want you to tell your neighbor or answer out loud. You might not even know him. And it's kind of weird if they, like, if they heard this. But what is that one thing? What's that one thing that the devil uses to tempt you the most? That, that one thing, I mean, you should know what that is. That everybody's got that one thing, or, or those two things, that the devil uses to, to tempt us. So I want to start off with one of my temptations that I've been leading up to for weeks. And, uh, and uh, I'll just roll it out there right now. I, I'm tempted by food. I, I'm, I'm getting to an age where I, I enjoy eating. And I've talked about several of those temptations. I mean, you can put some chips in our house, like some pretzels or Fritos. And, and th that's cool. I can walk right by that. Not know, my problem's sweets, right? Oreos. Chocolate chip. Oatmeal. Peanut butter. Amen. I hear, I mean, I'm preaching now, right? Huh? And I, I know it's, I'm struggling with it. They don't last long in our cupboard. I mean, I can, I can clean, I can clean that stuff out. Um, it, it just, it isn't going to last very long. We, uh, last Sunday, um, I'll tell you kind of how it rolled out. Last Sunday, we went over to some friend's house for like a graduation party and they had all kinds of food. I mean, and they had chips and they had hamburgers and pulled pork and and, you know, I ate. I had my fill. I mean, I was feeling it, you know. We were all sitting around outside. And, and somebody came out and said, does anybody want any of the cake? I do. I mean, it was like my mouth. It spoke and I wasn't even there. And uh, they started handing out the cake. 
And they came out, and I'm full, okay? I'm full. And they're handing out the cake, and I'm sitting next to this guy, and two pieces of cake are coming our way. And he reaches up and grabs this piece of cake. It's one of the center pieces, just got a little icing on it. And he grabbed that, and I looked, and that cake that was right there staring me in the eye had icing on the side and on the top, and it was extra, a little hunk on the side that they, and it was like, when I reached up and grabbed it, I like hurt. Ah! It was like, and I, I kid you not, this is what I, I said, this must be of God, because I love icing, and I said that's true. Now, I, I, was, I ate it. I mean, I cleared it out. I mean, it just a temptation right there. You got to choose, right? And uh, I go home. We get home late. Family gets cleaned up. We actually put a movie, and we got a movie in, and, and watching the movie, and, and I'm full. I'm full, but, but there was this thing that was going through my mind. I, some friends of ours had, had ordered and delivered, had delivered to us Sherry's Berries. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but show it up on the screen, will you right now, Sherry's Berries? I didn't, they, they're like chocolate covered strawberries, huge, and, 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 and ours came with cookies. I didn't know they had chocolate covered cookies. They came to our house, and, and I'm sitting on the couch. The, everybody like goes to bed, and I'm like, I wanna finish the movie. Everybody's like crashed. And you know, I don't know if I wanted to watch the movie, but I had this thought in my head. There's a piece of that, there's a half of a cookie in the refrigerator. And I was thinking about that through that whole movie. In fact, instead of just doing it, uh, can you bring me some of the Sherry Berries cookies? I, did, I just want to look, just show you this right here. Thanks, Jim. You can just, yeah. the, here, they wrap them individually. They are so, I mean, you're looking like, I'd say at least 400. I mean, I'm not, I don't care about the nutritional value of that, right? It's like uh, ignorance is bliss. I don't want to know. I mean, you just look at it, and, and that's 100 calories, I think, you know, right there, just, just a thought. And, and we had them in the refrigerator. And you, and you got to, like, open them with scissors because it's too tough, you know, packaging. And, and you break it in half, and... <sighs> Can you smell that? It was awesome. That, here, 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 Jim. Give me. I, I went and I got that and I ate that other cookie. Now, now I want to ask you a question. I'm not going to ask you if you came to church with Sherry's Berries cookies on your mind, okay? I'm not going to ask you that because nobody did. But I want to ask you this. When I'm holding that cookie and you're seeing that, I mean, it's like, hey, preacher, what are you going to do with those after church? I'll take those off your hands. I mean, right? Are you willing to, are you, does anybody, would anybody want those cookies? Yeah. Yeah, well, that is how temptation works, right? I mean, you're not thinking about a thing and boom, Jerry's Berries cookies right there in your mind, right? That's how it works with me. That's how temptation works with everybody. This thought that just pops in your mind. And you know what you got to do with that temptation? You can either go after that thing or, or you can run away from that, that, that one thing. Uh, we're going to go into the scripture today. And we're going to go to Genesis 13 in a moment. But I want to start with a passage from the book of James, a classic passage in chapter 1. James rolls this out, the brother of Jesus. And uh, I want to just read right here, verse 13. And the Bible reads this. It says, it says, when tempted. Notice it says, when tempted. It doesn't say, if you get tempted. It says, you're going to get tempted because you're like everybody else. And God is telling us, when you're tempted, no one should say, God's tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. In other words, you know, you have people say, the, the devil made me do it. Look, the devil can't do a thing because he's not all powerful unless you load the gun and you put the gun in his hand. He cannot shoot you. He cannot touch you. God is all-powerful. The devil is not, but he works at the place of our desire. He's actually going to tempt us in the areas where we're tempted. Because you know what? The devil can't tempt me in some areas. I just don't fall for that. It's our own evil desire. Look what happens next when we fall to some temptation. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown gives birth to death, to death. So if you don't get anything else out of this message today, understand this, when you fall to temptation, temptation leads to death. 
every time it leads to death if you choose to fall to the temptation and fall to the sin things will die and you will experience the death of a marriage you'll experience the death of a career you'll experience the death of a relationship you'll experience the death of your finances sin always leads to death and don't miss this, there is a progression that's going on in the book of James. It's, it's, it's like a cycle. I mean, I'm just not going to wake up one morning and go look at my 600-pound life, right? It happens in a progression. And I want you to identify today when we look at this, where are you in this progression? Where are you in this cycle? Because we're going to look at, at four stages, four phases, four progressive steps until we reach death if we fall to temptation. And the first step is this, flirtation. Flirtation, in fact, I want to have some audience participation today, and I don't want you to get tempted to get angry at the preacher by saying he made us say something all through the sermon today. Don't follow that. So everybody on the count of three, one, two, three, flirtation. Everybody knows what flirtation is, right? You flirt with somebody, they flirt back. Flirting is literally seeing how close we can get to something without making that final commitment, right? It's, it's flirting without actually getting all the way there. I mean, that's how it works. That's flirtation. So now we're going to go back to Genesis 13. There was a, there's, there's a guy named Abram in the scripture. He's later known as Abraham. And if you have a church background, you know that song, right? Father Abraham had many sons and father... Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord, right arm. You know, do you remember that? It's like, thank you, preacher. I grew up with that. It's stuck in your mind. You know, praise God if you don't know that. There's this guy named <laughs> Father Abraham. He's in the scriptures, and he's an awesomely faithful guy. And, and God's going to bless his descendants. And God one day says, Abraham, I, I want you to move. And I want you to go to a place where I want to tell you sometime where that is. I'm not going to tell you now. And he goes, I, okay. And he's known as being faithful. God loved him. So he picks up and he moves. But he takes all this stuff with him. And some family and some friends and everything. And one of the persons that goes with him is his nephew named Lot. And this is the character going, that we're going to look at today. His nephew named Lot. So... So get this, God blesses Abraham because he's so faithful. But because Lot is with Abraham, Lot gets blessed as well. So uh, get this, you can be blessed by God just by who or what you're hanging around. So you need to know who or what you're hanging around with, right? Who or what you're associating with because God works that way. So Lot, in the Bible right here, there, there's these, he's, 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 God's blessing them. And, and, and they're like going out and God blesses Abraham and Lot so much that it's like one of their, their, their servants start to fight with one another. It's like, you know, what kind of day are you having today, Lot? Well, you know, it's another bad day. Our servants, uh, we got so many of them, they're just fighting again because we're so blessed and they're just tripping over one another. And, and Abraham, I mean, that is a wealthy man's problem, you know. They're so blessed. And Abraham goes a lot and he says, look, we just need to kind of part ways and there's so much land out here God's given us. I'll, I'll go over here and you can go anywhere you want. Anywhere, Lot. You can go anywhere. Choose where you want to go. And we're going to pick up the story in Genesis chapter 13, and we're going to see here where Lot decided to move. So in Genesis chapter 13, verse 12, the Bible says that Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived in the cities of the plain. And listen to this, it says, and he pitched his tents near Sodom. He pitched his tents near Sodom. And in fact, I want you to say near Sodom with me on account of... Yeah, well, yeah, you did it right there. Near Sodom, he pit, and, and this is huge. And this is why it's huge, the next verse. It says that the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. So we got Lot in this story. And he pitches his tents near Sodom, near this wicked place. And if we could time travel back and say, Lot, why did you choose near Sodom? You know what I'm saying? This wicked place. And, 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 and Lot would say, you know what? It, it's, it's okay. It's, it's like there's a lot of stuff in that city. And we know that it's wicked, but, but we're not going there. It's like we know about it. But, but I just want to get close enough because there's something about it that intrigues me. I just want to see how close I can get to Sodom. So he pitches his tents near Sodom. You see what he's doing? Now, I want to illustrate this point with this stool right here. 
this stool, I want this stool to represent sin. And if you're a parent, I think you'll get this illustration pretty well, right? So, so, so that represents sin, and you tell your child, don't sit in that chair and watch your child do. Don't sit in that chair. I'm not sitting in it. I'm not, I'm not sitting. Oh, I told you, don't sit in that chair. Not going to sit in it. I'm not sitting in it. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sitting in this chair. <laughs> Isn't that what we do? That's, what, that's exactly what we do as adults is we get as near to sin sometimes as we can because we just want to see how close we get. Lot pitched his tents near Sodom. He knew what was in that city. I mean, back in youth ministry, I mean, back in the 80s when I did that, I mean, this was a question that, that middle schoolers and high schoolers always ask. I hope it's different today, but they say, how far can we go before it's sin? How far can we go? And we, and we, uh, we, used, to, we used to illustrate it with a baseball diamond. First base, second base, third base, home base. You know, first base holding hands. You got all that other stuff. I mean, home base, always home run. Still means the same thing, I guess, today, right? How far can we go before it's really sin? How far can we go? There is this flirtation stage. And that's the, that's the wrong, we should not be asking how close, how close can I get to this? Because the Christ followers should be saying, how close can I get to Jesus? Because the closer we get to Jesus, the farther it is that we get from that flirtation that's trying to draw us in through that temptation. I want to tell you how it worked out uh, for me. I, I have confessed this before. Before this congregation, I know I heard a couple of gasps, but, but I want to illustrate it again. I think it's important. When I was 12 years old, I was introduced to pornography. And, and that struggle with lust and that temptation persisted. I didn't grow up in church. And when I was age 20, I became a Christian. The temptation went on beyond that. So if you're here today and you're looking for the perfect church and the perfect pastor, this isn't it. <laughs> we, in fact, this is a place where no perfect people is allowed. You know what I'm saying? It's not. If you're perfect, we're going to mess you up. <laughs> I, I want you to know that. I want you to know that. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ can fix this. But, but this is a part of the story that, I, that I've, I've never told. I went uh, to Bible college. So here I had a youth ministry. It was two years after I became a Christian. And uh, just been a Christian two years. So here I had a youth ministry and I was traveling to Bible college two hours away from one another. So I would go uh, to my youth ministry and I'd drive back on Sunday night. Every week I did this thing. And half my halfway point, it was like, you know, I, it, gas was cheaper at the halfway point, the midpoint between these two locations. And I'd stop there and get gas and I would go, you know, use the facilities if I needed to. And, and, I would always get a Dairy Queen ice cream whether I wanted one or not. So you know you can understand where I'm at right there uh, talking about sweets. But, but I, I'd go and, and the gas stations would have like five cents cheaper here one day. And I, and I, I hit them all. There were all kinds right in this one little area. And I mean I was a student. I needed the cheapest gas I could get. And uh, I went to this one particular gas station. And I, I went to check out. And guess what was in the magazine rack right near the checkout at this gas station? Yeah, I'm not going to say it. So anyway, I drive on, I go on. So every week I'm doing this. So every week I'm stopping, I'm getting my ice cream, I'm getting gas, I'm filling up. Well, it started going where before I even got to the gas station, I'm going, you know what? I need to fill, before I got to near the exit, I'm going, well, my car needs some gas, right? It's not a sin to go fill up your gas tank at the cheapest gas station, right? So I'm like thinking about this now before I ever get to the exit. And that starts going on. And then I'm starting to think. So I'm going to this gas station. I'm checking out. And I'm checking this stuff out every week. And I, then I started thinking, you know what? I hope somebody, I hope there's nobody at the gas station when I get off at the exit because nobody's going to be in line. And that means I can linger there. And I would get off with anticipation, with excitement. And, and I remember one time I got off that exit and, and there's nobody there. And, and I would go and I would look at the candy, right? And I could see... Because, see, it's not a sin, is it, to look at magazine covers? Is it, right? 
And I checked out, and you know what I did one night? I bought a magazine. I did. And, and I got in the car, and I was so sickened by that. I mean, I'm thinking, what if that guy knows somebody that goes to the Bible college, he's going to tell them I'm going to get kicked out of school. I didn't have that thing very long at all, and it was gone. But that's how temptation works. Temptation works when it starts in the, it starts with flirtation. And the question today is, what are you flirting with? What are you flirting with in your life that you know that you need to be fleeing from? What's that one thing that you're standing, that you're pitching your tents near Sodom so close because you think you can handle it? We need to ask that question because I tell you what, if you don't know where you're tempted, you're going to fall to that temptation. Stage one is flirtation. Stage number two is rationalization. Rationalization. That's a big word. I want you to say it with me. One, two, three. Rationalization. We all know what that stands for. When, when we make rational our lives, rational lives, everybody does that. We do that. I mean, I ask how many of you a few weeks ago, like, got ticketed because you broke the speed limit. We got some fast people here. People are raising their hands. One guy's like raising his foot in the air. I mean, we're sinners. We get that. I have talked with police officers at the excuses that they've heard of people who have been speeding. And, and I remember one cop said, you know, pre you preachers are the worst. I mean, I mean, I have preachers all the time saying like, it's like I was speeding because I had to get to the funeral. The guy's dead, but I got to get to the funeral fast, right? I mean, I mean, we, we, we do that. So Lot's story was he started to rationalize. So see, he pitched his tents near Sodom, right? Because he just, he just, there's something about it that intrigued him. So I'm going to go now to, to chapter 14 and flip over to verse 11. And, uh, and by the way, there's some turmoil going on in the land. There's some kings fighting. And this is where we pick up this first verse here in verse 11. It says, Four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. Then they went away. And get this. It says, They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. Can you, can you say that with me? Living in Sodom. How'd that happen? How's he living in Sodom? I think he got there through rationalization. I think he started to rationalize. I'm sure if you were to ask Lot, hey Lot, you pitched your tents near Sodom. Now you're living in Sodom. What's going on? Oh, hey, no, it's okay. It's cool. You know, listen, 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 listen. My kids, I had to, I had to, they were going into Sodom High School every day. I mean, they had back and forth. My wife belonged to the Sodomite Exercise Club. And three days, she had to drive in. And I'm working here, and I've got to go get my supplies in the Sodom. I tell you what, it just ended up being, it's a lot easier just to move here. It, it was just simpler to move here. He is living in Sodom. I mean, don't we do the same thing? Don't we rationalize? I, I have spoken, um, there, there, there are couples that, that are living together. And I want to say this, if you're living together and not married, I'm glad you're here. I mean, it, it's awesome that you're here and, and that you're wanting to follow Jesus. But I, I've, I've asked couples that are living together this question over the years. And, and I'm going, like, you know, how, how'd that end up happening? When did you make that transition? You know, usually in a premarital uh, counseling situation where I'm going to marry the couple. And they say, well, you know, we, we were like working at the same place. And it was just so, so much convenient. It was just a matter of convenience. We just ended up moving. Instead of doing all that driving, we just moved in together. Or um, uh, it was just cheaper. You know, we, it's just like, why well, rent two apartments? And, and we rationalize that stuff. And, and, and we just try to think about that. There, there are people who connect with, with old flames. You know, see somebody from high school, Facebook, whatever it is. And the next thing you know, like, they're going to lunch with them. It's like, should you be doing that? And it's like, you know, it's just, they've always understood me. And, and I don't really believe God, God put them in my path because God wants me to be happy. People rationalize that. Where's that heading? I mean, if you go out in a parking lot and you see your child picking up, playing with a rattlesnake, are you going to go, oh, I'm not going to interrupt him because you know he's having, he's happy playing with that rattlesnake. <laughs> no, you know that. That happiness is going to be short-lived. Why? Because that rattlesnake is designed to bite and to kill. That's what happens when we rationalize. Listen, if, if, if you're here 
right now and, and you've done this thing and, and you're, if there's something in your life that's off kilter and you're just trying to rationalize that, you've sit here far too long. And you need to think about what that is if you started rationalizing your behavior and that lot rationalized. Here's the third step in this progression. This is even a bigger word. And with my accent, I've got to go desensitization. So can you say that with me on the count of three? One, two, three, desensitization. <laughs> I love that word. But have you ever seen something wrong with somebody and it's just like you can't, you, you just can't bring yourself to, to tell them like you eat, like lunch and, and you eat salad and they've got this hunk of lettuce on their teeth? Have you ever seen that? And you don't know them that well, but you're going like, in front of them so they get the hint like hey what kind of toothpaste do you use <laughs> you know it's like it's 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 you're just trying to work that thing out now I want to tell you a story and uh, I hope I uh, I hope I can tell it but um, th this didn't happen to me this happened to a friend of mine and he, he was at this, this conference and this lady was up singing and and she could sing great he said and the conference is just filled with con conference goers and, and they had her image projected up on the big screen and he said they had some incredible HD cameras, right? And he says she hits this note, and everybody's wrapped, and she's like, ah, and she's singing this note, and this HD camera is right there, getting a close-up right there, and everybody saw it at the same time. <laughs> this huge booger <laughs> that was singing vibrato <laughs> that everybody could see. Now, I... Now, now listen, if you're having a bad day, just say booger, right? <laughs> Is booger not a funny word? I, I know you've probably never heard that in church. And listen, if you're not laughing right now, you've been in church too long. <laughs> it's a funny word. I mean, my kids say it. Sometimes we say it when nothing's going on. We crack up. I'm 50 years old. Listen, that's still funny. If you're too sophisticated to laugh, I mean, it's a funny word. This girl was clueless. She had no clue what was going on around her. Desensitization. I mean, somebody should have just told her, you know, before she got up, hey, hey, uh, you know, before you go up, you, you need to go to the bathroom and check that. Th Desensitization. We do this with regard to temptation. Once you get in this chair, you, you just kind of, you, you don't get it. You don't see these things. You don't realize what's going on. Sin always leads to death. Always. It always leads to death. And it's, it's never going to get better when we get in that chair. I mean, one of the biggest lies that people say is, you know what? This is my life. I'm doing this. It's, it's, a, it's, 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 it's cool. I know what I'm doing. And, and they don't get it. I mean, Lot sat in that chair for at least 13 years we've determined between chapters 14 and chapters 19 of the book of Genesis he sat in that chair and he believe I think became desensitized we're going to flip over to to chapter 19 now of the book of Genesis with, with verse 1 and it says that two angels arrived in Sodom and and there were two there were angels that went to Abraham and said look we're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah it is so wicked there so these angels now come to Lot and they're trying to get him out of the city and it says that two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. We cannot pass over this because if you were sitting at the gateway of the city, you know what that means? It means that you're a leader in that city. So Lot went from pitching his tents near Sodom to living in Sodom and now he's leading the entire thing. When he saw these angels, he got up to meet them and he bowed down with his face to the ground. So, he's playing the part now. And you know, by the way, you can pretend to be very religious on the outside and totally steeped in sin. And, and he's playing the part here and he bows down the ground and he says in verse 2, My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way in the morning. And Lot didn't want them around very long. And, and the person who is sit, seated here, they don't want people around them 
that are following Jesus for too long of time. And, and Lot's saying, hey, you can spend the night, but you just take off early in the morning, will you? Because don't really want you, want you around that long. No, they answered, we'll, we'll spend the night in the square. Verse 3, but, but he insisted so strongly that they did go with him. He entered, they entered his house and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they got into bed, all the men from every part of the city, both uh, city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. Now, it's getting pretty serious right here. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. That's a problem. That's a problem right here. Here is this mob coming to the house of Lot to enact gang violence on these two guests. And look at this. It says, Lot went outside to meet them and he shut the door behind him and he said, no, no, my friends. You get that? These are his friends now. His friend. No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who've never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do with them what you like. But don't do anything to these men. They have come under the protection of my roof. Any girl here saying, I, I wish Lot was my dad? No, no, no. How do you go? How do you go? From I think it's a great idea to offer my daughters up to these guys for vi this kind of violence enacted upon them. Do you think maybe when Lot was getting blessed back there with Abraham, if you say, hey, what do you want for your life? Lot, what do you want to do? That he's going, you know what? I want to eventually just offer my daughters up for gang rape. No. I don't think he thought that. But he sat in this chair. For 13 years he sat here. And when you sit here, things change. It cha if you're here 13 months, if you're here 13 weeks, 13, 13 minutes you sit in that chair and your perspective is going to change. It's just, you're going to be affected by that. Sin always leads to death. I heard about this reality show just this past week. It's called Snake Salvation on National Geographic Television. I never heard of it. Uh, anybody ever heard of Snake Salvation? And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a guy in Kentucky who handles rattlesnakes. And, and uh, the, the, the main character, I guess, was this guy named Jamie Coots. And, and he died in February because the rattlesnake bit him. He didn't think he was going to die. His son, and this is when I read the story, his son, I guess, just past Sunday or something, got bit by a snake, Cody. And, and, and I, he, maybe he's dead by now. I don't think he was the day before yesterday when I read the article. Handling a rattlesnake. What's a rattlesnake's instinct? The instinct is, is to bite. Listen, you, you flirt with the devil, you might think you got the upper hand. I'm telling you what, he is going to bite. He is going to suck the lifeblood out of you because that is what he's trying to do. And there are people here today that you used to think that there were some things morally and there were some behaviors. There was a time when you used to think something was wrong in the past and you sat here so long that you just can't figure that out any longer because sin always leads to death because there's desensitization in your life. Point four, the fourth phase is destruction destruction can you can you repeat that with me destruction that's where sin ends up I mean this is not the fun chair we might think it's the fun chair but sin always destroys people Greg why would you preach a marriage uh, sermon that it's got so much uncomfortable stuff in it I tell you why because we say that for I love my church I love God's church and I'm sick and tired of seeing people's lives destroyed by this destructive sin that's in our life. And I'm sick of it. I wish people could pull up out of it and be rescued from it and be set free from it. And I'm sick and tired of seeing people's lives destroyed. These angels, they like go to Lot and say, bro, you got to get out of the city. 
You've got to get out of here. We're going to destroy this thing. And he hesitates. He, he doesn't want to go. And, and, and they take off. And, and the story is that Lot's life, wife looked back and she turns to a pillar of salt. We don't have time to get into that. But he grabs his two daughters and they go and they go flee. And they, they try to find a place, an inner city, but they're afraid there. They end up living in a cave, homeless. Here's this guy that was blessed by God. He had everything. And he's homeless with his daughters. Because sin always takes. Sin always destroys. Sin always gets the upper hand when you fall to that temptation and you start sitting there and it starts taking its toll. Verse 30. Jump down to verse 30. It says uh, that Lot and his two daughters left Zoar and settled in the mountains for he was afraid to stay in Zoar. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. One day the older daughter said to the younger, Our father's old, and there's no man around here to lie with us, as is the custom all over the earth. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. Let's get our father uh, to drink wine and then lie with him and preserve our family line through our father. I mean, does anybody think that she's thinking right? I mean, she's lived, she's lived in that place for how long? That night they got their father to drink wine and the older daughter went and lay with him. He was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. The next day the older daughter said to the younger, Last night I lay with my father. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight and you go in and lie with him so we can preserve our, our family line through our father. Some desensitization taking place here. So they got their father to drink wine that night also and the, a younger daughter Went in and lay with him again. He was not aware of it when she lay down and when she got up. So both, Lotter, both Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. I mean, anybody want to, it's, that's weird. That, that's weird. I mean, do you think when Lot pitched his tent near Sodom, and you could have went down and said, hey, define success. Where are you heading in Lot? Where are you heading in life, Lot? And he's saying, you know what? I, I'm a... Uh, uh, I just can't wait till my wife's dead and, and, and I'm homeless and, and, I, and I impregnate my daughters. You know, do you think he would have been able to articulate that or thought that would have ever happened? No. But flirtation leads to rationalization. It leads to desensitization and ultimately destruction. So the question is today, how in the world do you get out? How do you get out? How do you climb up out of that chair when you really don't see what's going on around you? How do you do it? The Bible has a prescription that works. And there's a couple of steps. And one is we've got to confess to God. We've got to confess to God. In fact, can you say that with me? Confess to God. We've got to confess to God. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I know a guy that used to say, that's the coolest verse in the Bible. I can go out and do what I want, and I just confess it to God. I'm a say, and he, he's, he's got to forgive me. I can do whatever I want because of that verse. That's not what that verse means. It's not what it means. If you're a Christian covered by the blood of Jesus, we've got to confess before God. He's going to forgive us, but he wants us to see sin as he sees sin. He wants us to see it like he does. So confession is, God, I'm flirting with somebody at work, and I don't want to stop it. Confession is, you know, I've been doing this behavior so long, and I'm, I'm sick and tired of it. I, just, I want to get away from it. God, please forgive me for doing that. Confession is, is God, forgive me for. And you fill in the blank, whatever that one thing is that you're doing right now, that you need to be... Confession is not, God, I messed up. You going to do it again? Yeah, probably so. <laughs> That's not confession. So we can confess and God will forgive. But here is an incredibly important step that a lot of people miss. Point two, 
is we've got to confess to others. Can you say that with, on three? One, two, three. Confess to others. We've got to confess to other people. I mean, this is, this is a difficult part, right? Because people in church are perfect, right? Isn't that the perception? You got to be perfect to go to church. And, and how am I going to go confess it to somebody at church? Because they're perfect there. I mean, when you, when you got a problem, where do you go? When you got a problem, you go to the bar. I mean, I spent a lot of time before age 20 doing things I shouldn't have done. When you got problems, you go to the bar. When you get your life perfect, you go to the church, right? So why would we think that we would go to a church filled with perfect people to confess to somebody? Because if I do that, they're going to kick me out of church. You know, hey, I know they crucified Jesus, but you should have seen my old church. A lot of people getting crucified in my home church. There's no perfect people in this church and we've got to understand that and we can can feel in fact the the people down your road left and right they've probably sinned two to one against you don't look if you did that that'd be three to one you know what I'm saying that'd be weird and and we start judging one another right the book of James tells us this and I want to read this verse together the book of James in fact let me just look at it up here and so let's let's start let's just read this out loud together therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective so we pray for each other we confess to one another what so we can be healed healing comes when we confess it I told you about the struggle that I had since age 12 I still struggle with that temptation yeah your preacher standing up here and telling you I still struggle with that temptation you know when I was freed I was freed when I started confessing to others and it's not because of anything that I was doing but God is able to heal if God can heal me he can heal anybody and he can heal you today and there are a lot of people that's stuck in this cycle and man, you feel bad, you feel guilt. And we're going to talk about that next week as the devil is also the one who is the accuser. And, and you're struggling with guilt and you confess to God all the time. And you just can't climb up out of that one pit. It's because you've not been healed. You've not confessed to others. We're going to start Celebrate Recovery here in a few months where it's going to go on every week because there is some intense battles that people are facing and we need this. This confession to God, confession to others is point five. It's step number five in that process. And I tell you what, you may never be healed of that one thing that not only are you tempted with, you may always be tempted with it, but you're going to keep falling to it until you're healed and until you confess that with other people. What is that one thing? The devil can't make you do it. He just can't. You do it because you want to do it. Even though it makes you sick. And it's going to destroy you. Break free from that today, will you? Would you pray with me? Father, I pray in these next several minutes that every, every person in this place would understand this progression that leads to death starts with temptation. And I know, Father, there are people today struggling here with something. And, and I know that we preach here and teach that it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay not okay. We want you to get okay, but, it, but it's okay to not be okay right now. And if you confess today and ask for help, this church, the Oasis Church, will not throw stones at you because we're all there. We've all been there. And we, as a church, want to be the church to you. If God has spoken to you today and said, look, you need to flee from that thing that you're doing. You need to confess to me, and I've heard you, God, saying it. But, but you need to confess that to others so they can walk alongside you because you need people. You need to be healed of this and stop in the struggle. As a church, we want to be that for you today. We want to pray with you. We won't throw stones at you. And we're try, we've tried today to prepare a way to do that. There are people that, that are moving right now, that are, that are getting up and, and brushing by you. They're going to be standing in the lobby, going through the back doors. And today you have the opportunity to go meet with them and pray. And we're going to take you to a, a private room. And nobody's going to be alone. 
but, but we want to pray and have that privacy today because we don't want any barrier to be broken because you need to be healed of that and God wants you to be healed of that. Let me tell you what, Satan is doing everything he can in your mind right now to say, don't do that. You can do that later. You can climb up. You can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Don't, you don't have to depend upon other people. God has made us a path of healing in Scripture and he says to confess one to another and we'll be healed. We want to offer you that today. Today, if you've heard God's voice and you need prayer and you want to confess, we have people waiting in the lobby right now. If you would get up right now and exit. Exit through the doors. I mean, people probably think you're going to the bathroom. You don't have to worry about that. If you need prayer and you need to confess, please get up right now and hear the Spirit's voice and start the pathway of healing. Start the pathway of healing today. Nobody's perfect here. Nobody here has it all together. We just want to help you walk away from that thing that's going to kill you. Father, we thank you for your freedom. We thank you that, that, that in you, that we are freed and what we have done does not define us. I pray, Father, that, that everyone who has chosen to sit down in this sin chair would be set free today, that you clean us up, that that's the purpose for your death on the cross. And, Father, I pray for freedom today, freedom to have the courage to allow us to follow you like you've called us to do.